I had a premonition of what this room would look like after this talk. And I hope I'm wrong. Um, it's, uh, so so one, of, one of my goals in this talk is to prove that you cannot actually f foretell the future but, uh, from visions given in dreams. So uh, what we are doing is we are turning C uh, oh my laptop's gone to sleep. We are turning CDF um, into a uh, so CDF and BDF are very are very similar. Um, we already have the ability to generate CTF directly from the to, uh, 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 directly from the compiler. Internally, it generates it from dwarf, but this is not visible to the uh, uh, to the outside world. Um, we already have the, ab uh, the ability to uh, 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 to omit it. There is a library which can read it and write it and deduplicate it, and the linker can do all this deduplication for you. You don't need to pass anything. If there's a .ctf section in binaries, they are deduplicated automatically. The all you can tell is that the linker takes a little bit longer. It's very similar. Why not make it identical? Or at least, why not make it into why not make CTF into a superset of BTF so that you can omit BTF if you don't need the extra stuff CTF provides, such as if you're linking the if you're linking stuff for the kernel. Um, the format is different. I've got a link there to the, I've got a link there to the cauldron, to the cauldron talk in which I describe the differences. But we don't care about the differences because for kernel use, we'll just omit BTF. Um, I'll always keep C CTF a compatible superset of BTF as long as I can tell what BTF looks like. I'm get, I, I'll, I'll get to that later on. Um, we only care about the superset as when you, where user space is concerned. My, my understanding is we're work that, that BTF is thinking about user space support. It may want to steal some ideas uh, for, uh, from what CTF has done because there's already code to handle it and you can just reuse it. Um, so. It's not, it's not quite identical. Um, CTF could do things like, um, it, it, for all the, all the symbols in a, in a shared library or, uh, or anything else with a symbol table, a dynamic symbol table, it can, it's got an efficient way of representing what type all those symbols are. Um, you don't need that in the kernel because the kernel doesn't have an elf symbol table. Um, they use the same type. You can make it very close. Um, we can make it close enough that BTF tools can handle, it can almost certainly handle even CTF, even the, with all the superset stuff turned on, with only a few slight additions which have already been proposed by Alan McGuire. Um, we can, um, and, 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 and the, our question is, LD can deduplicate, can deduplicate BTF when we've done all of this, so why does Pahol need to deduplicate it as well? We can just have it read in BTF in whatever form is most convenient for Pahol and do the other things it needs to do to augment to augment the BTF which comes in, you know, which is generated from the information available in Dwarf, and then write it out again in whatever form the uh, whatever form the kernel likes it likes just as it already does. This would certainly make compiles faster because the last time I benchmarked the amount of Dwarf that was produced when you built the kernel or well, an enterprise kernel, it came to about 15 gig. Writing out 15 gig of data takes a while, even if your disk is fast, um, and this doesn't need to be generated at all if we never actually write the Dwarf out. Uh, also, we need to maintain one less deduplicator, and my understanding is no one really likes the whole deduplicator. I might be wrong, um, but one less deduplicator seems like a good thing. I'm certainly not going to stop maintaining the libctf deduplicator. It's nice and easy to maintain after much pain getting it into its current form. So, the current approach for building, BT uh, for building BTF, as I understand it, looks kind of like this. Um, I could be wrong, but I think that's ki that, uh, that's kind of what happens. Um, and the and the deed up for the modules happens module by module, and the uh, um, uh, and they don't interact. Inter the deed ups don't interact with each other much. CTF has a very similar, it has a, the same approach that split BTF that, uh, uses built right into the core of it a parent child relationship uh, with parents containing types shared by children. Um, they are um, the CT current CTF approach looks like this. Um, you build with minus GCTF. LD does all the de does deduplication for the modules with no change to the LD command line at all. You, um, we, we currently strip out the CTF again because we don't actually want it in the modules when they're loaded into the kernel. Uh, um, so you end up with separate .ctf files. These are then used as, uh, as input to a second stage linker, which we happen to call CTF archive. Obviously, we rename it to BTF archive if it was linking BTF. This uses the exact same code that GNU-LD uses, which is in the libctf library. It's only about 200 lines. Uh, to re-deduplicate all the modules and the core kernel together, giving you an output, which, an output in a specialized archive, um, which, has the sh which has a shared repository containing all types which are used in, in at least one of the, uh, um, of the children. And the children consist of a, VM, a child for VM Linux, 
and one child to anything which can be built as a module, whether or not it actually is, and one child to every module. And this is all in one file. Put all the files together, and they come to about 16 meg. Um, and then we hand, so we handle all the modules on the fly. This is the most extreme approach I am proposing. There is no requirement to go straight to this in the first place. This is, this is just showing what the code can do now. Um, we, can, uh, we, uh, we, we, we might do, uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, we can be more compatible with what BTF does to start with, and that's probably a good place to start, simply by cutting bits out of this infrastructure and doing less. Uh, doing more would require more work. Um, I think I, 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 I discuss what CTF, what, what CTF archive is doing is, is doing there briefly. It's a it's a two line it's a two line process um, because after um, after the DG, uh, the initial linking process um, when LD has run over each module, that itself is a little archive which consists of all the deduplicated types and children which uh, uh, which contain in members named after the translation unit every type in that translation unit which conflicts with other t which is has an as an inconsistent definition which violates the one definition rule within that module um, and that, while this in theory shouldn't happen in the kernel there are at least hundreds of, uh, of violations of the ODR in the kernel and more likely thousands i've personally encountered hundreds um, in practice, this isn't a problem because only C11 violates it, uh, uh, bans this. Uh, C99 doesn't. There are huge numbers of instances of this in the user space anyway. We need to handle it no matter what. Um, but it's quite possible that consumers won't want, to, won't want to worry about this. But at least we don't want to lie if one type is used as another type. We don't want to connect it to a type which is actually a different type that has the same name, which is, I think, what Pahol does at the moment. So the second round linker, which takes in all the module output or all the individual module CTFs. It's a two part, it's two passes at the moment. The first round deduplicate uh, fuses all those children into one, but if it has a ch if it has children with conflicting types in and marks all those conflicting types as hidden. So you can't look them up by name. This is simply because it's only a two level parent child relationship in CTF. And the second round is to deduplicate all the modules in the core kernel against each other, shove all the types used by more than one into a, in, uh, into a shared parent, which comes out as about five megabytes. And that's it. Running CTF archive happens at the end. It's serial. It takes about a minute and a half. This is because it's completely not threaded. Uh, threading it is quite possible. I just haven't done it yet. Uh, that would speed it up by probably, I, don't, I think I mentioned this on the next slide. Oh, what's happened here? My screen just saved. We'd probably split it up by about 30 or 40%. Um, doing this with BTF would be much the same. Would be much the same. You generate BTF instead of CTF. You deed up it in the same way. You'd admit beat the BTF into similar archives, and then you'd hand them off to PA hole. How we'd hand them off to PA hole is another matter. Obviously, we can't do it in exactly the way we're doing now because we wouldn't be reading dwarf out of the, uh, uh, out of the binaries. Um, libctf already has functions to, de to uncompress these archives and hand them off to, the, uh, um, to, to, to something reading it, so they could just use libctf and call those. But it's whatever's most convenient for, for the PA for PA hole. But in particular, it wouldn't need to do any deed up. It wouldn't need to read dwarf. I think we should, if it needs to read dwarf for other reasons, for the annotations, any annotations it needs to do to BTF, I think we should extend BTF to transmit whatever that is through BTF, maybe strip it out at the PA hole stage so that all PA hole needs to read is BTF and we never need to generate any dwarf at all. Hopefully this wouldn't be too much work. Um, and why would you bother doing any of this? You can detect conflicting types. Um, consumers would need adjusting to use them, but they could just ignore them and pretend they didn't exist. Um, because it's a per module mmapped archive, you can just ignore all the components used by modules you don't care about. You don't need to load them. You don't need to read them in. Um, the advantage of handling, of having every module, whether it's built on or in or not, be a separate child, is that if you reconfigure the kernel and make something a module or not a module, they stay in the same place. Uh, which some traces and so on actually care about this. You can qualify types with their module name. You just have to handle a case where the same type appears in multiple modules with different definitions. Um, where, again, this is all optional. You may, you can do this later. You don't need to do it at all. I mean, consumers suddenly need to know about all this stuff, which might annoy people. So there are simpler approaches. We can start dropping things. We could drop the whole concept of conflicting types on the floor by simply deleting all the child archives as soon as we create them in the, in the, de in the deduplicator. It would speed up CTF archive. It would only need to do a one pass. It would probably speed it up by about 40%. Um, 
What you do with conflicting types in that, when you encountered a conflicting type in that case is not clear. Do we just delete the entire type chain that depends on the conflicting type? Do we terminate it in some sort of stub that says, hey, these types aren't valid? The only thing I'm not willing to do is point it at the type which is the wrong type, which has the same name, because that's just grotesque, uh, which is what um, <laughs> P.A. Hall seems to be doing right now. Um, we could get simpler. We could drop this whole mmappable archive uh, um, th uh, thing and just write out a bunch of individual dictionaries to some uh, uh, individual containers to some directory where P.A. Hole, PA Hole would read them in. Um, again, this is nice and easy. You'd want some way to indicate that every file you wrote is a child, uh, you know, basically a kernel module, or the parent, which is the shared uh, co copy of all of them. But we probably want that anyway. At the moment, that's in split BTF. There's no actual way to tell whether the split BTF is a, is a child, a module child, or a parent, except that it comes from a module. I think we want something in the header to say this is this is a child. Maybe. But again, this is all optional. We can make it even simpler. We could drop the special module named VM Linux and just stuff all the types directly into the shared dictionary. This is even more like what VM Linux is. Uh, sorry, what, what BTF is doing now. Uh, it roughly doubles the size of the shared of the shared repository, but you need those types anyway most of the time. Um, it's it, it doesn't do any it doesn't do any particular harm, uh, but I don't think having the module there does any particular harm either. Um, it depends what people find easiest. We can get even simpler. We can drop this weird built-in module thing and just say that whenever you recompile the kernel, will all the types move around. Um, uh, it has unfortunate inf implications if, you also, if you're also dropping conflicting types at the same time, uh, because all of a sudden there could be quite a lot of types which are suddenly conflicting, which they weren't before, simply because they were being, they're, they've got different definitions in some modules than in the core kernel, and there are at least hundreds of those types, and they'd all vanish, which is probably, well, they'd probably all vanish. We'd have to think of something to do with them. I, so I think we probably shouldn't do both those simplifications at the same time. But maybe we could try it. I mean, this is just a matter of turning features off that we've already got, and turning features off is much easier than writing them. Um, and I think if you put all these simplifications together, you end up with what we've got now. Um, you've got a pile of BTF in the parent, in the parent and a bunch of, pile, of, of, of piles of BTF in, in each real kernel module. I think that's what we're dealing with now. The only difference is that they never need to be deduplicated by PA hole, by PA hole, and it can just read in the BTF, augment it, and write it straight out again to wherever it likes. Um, if I'm wrong, please let me know. There are things people might worry about. I know I worried about them. Um, if you're not putting things in, uh, in dwarves, you can re-release dwarves whenever you want, whenever, you want, whenever BTF changes. Uh, Binutils is somewhat more rigid. It releases every, every half year or so, although Nick Clifton has said this is a completely arbitrary choice to align with Fedora, and he's willing to release whenever people want him to. Um, but the, uh, However, I've looked at how often dwarves releases, and it seems to be less often than Binutils is releasing at the moment, so maybe that's okay? Um, Backporting, the lots of people would say, what about, back we could just backport any feature additions because libctf would need to keep up with any additions in BTF to be able to deduplicate de them. As long as you don't try to backport them to before binutils 2.44, which is probably where this stuff will land, I'm still writing some of it, then we should be okay. Backporting before then is a flaming nightmare. Um, this does unfortunately mean that all of a sudden the requirement for binutils in the kernel would shoot up to a relatively recent one. But probably for at least a while, we want to maintain two, uh, both the old and the new code in PA hole anyway, just to make sure they're producing the same output and in case this whole idea doesn't work. So maybe that's OK. Um, in any, in, and in any case, you, um, libctf has a very stable API, uh, um, API and ABI. It's got version symbols in it. You could probably do a lot of this by simply, t by simply linking a new libctf from binutils 2.44 or whatever and just stuffing it in place over the libctf in an older binutils, as long as the older binutils is newer than about 2.35. This would work unless libctf has been hacked in the build process so that it's actually a statically linked, static linked library. Unfortunately, rel does exactly that, and all of a sudden that would mean that, the, that ld and so on is using a statically linked copy of libctf, and if you dropped a new dynamically linked copy in, it wouldn't pick it up. I, th I don't know why it's doing that. I've got to talk to Nick Clifton about that. Maybe we could change things. Um, there's also a licensing concern, which is at the moment libctf is, is GPLv3. This is almost certain to change because I've already asked for, uh, asked for it to change, and we're more or less the, I'm more or less the only author at the moment. 
Uh, this was a mistake on my part. Um, I would like LLD to use it, um, which should be, which would then suddenly mean LLD could deduplicate BTF in exactly the same way. Um, and it needs to be LGP, LGPL for that. Actually, I'd like it to be able to be linkable into arbitrary programs because we've got other, other use cases with, um, in, involving that. So it definitely needs to be LGPL. So that is happening. Or that, or that is going to happen. Are there any things we need from BTF to make it to make this create all this this the, uh, this crazy plan happen? There's only really one thing, which is that we uh, libctf has fairly harsh backward compatibility um, obligations. We can still read every version of Linux CTF that has ever been produced and write it out as CTF v4 and deduplicate it um, and link them and link them together. If BTF changes. We, because the bin utils and the kernel are not released simultaneously, we need to know which version we're reading. We need to know whether those changes have ha whether those format changes have happened or not. So format or semantic changes should be accompanied by a format version bump. We've got a format version in the header. We really just bump it whenever it changes, and I'll bump the CTF version to match. And, and uh, um, without a change, when I read some BTF, I don't know whether I'm reading the old version or the new version. It's just been a silent format change, and I don't know, uh, uh, and I don't know w uh, which one to pick up. I don't know how hard it is for you to make format version bumps, but I wouldn't think it's that hard. You just need it's just a byte in the header. It's only one byte, so eventually we'd run out. But I think it would be a while before we got through 255 of them. Um, at one of the things I was considering for the CTF headers is to add a header for uh, with, a, with, with a pile of flags in, so we could possibly add compatibility flags as well, kind of like the fi various file systems have, so you don't need to bump the uh, version quite so promiscuously. The other thing, Alan Maguire has a nice proposal for a layout section in the header, which it, which because uh, one of the problems that CTF and BTF both have is that if you add new type kinds. There's no way to read any for older readers to read any of the type section because you don't know how long they are unless you can read the re read the type kinds reliably, unless you already know about what the type kinds are. So Alan has a scheme where you can do, where you can describe for any given type kind value, where, which what offsets and there might be multiple to read in the in in that type entry to be able to figure out what the VLAN is, so you can skip to get to the next type entry. Uh, CTFv4 adds a couple of very strange new type kinds, which are literally two types stuffed together. Uh, <laughs> um, it's described in the Cauldron talk, um, so we can represent much larger types. So you'll never want to represent a 50 gigabyte uh, um, uh, uh, structure in uh, BTF, but unfortunately there are crazy programs in user space that do that, or that have 80 million, 80 million members. Um, uh, and again, BTF would never want that. User space can, uh, can sometimes deal, deal with it. So. I think this would be beneficial for BTF as well, which is why Alan proposed it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have so much incompatibility. Old code could read, new, could read newer BTF versions. It might be worth adding. Uh, but that's, that's probably all we need from BTF for all of this stuff to work. There are some other obscure benefits of CTF v4. They don't apply to the kernel at the moment, but if you're considering user space, user space BTF, I hope you'd consider looking at the CTF spec, which does exist. It has a formal spec, and, 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 and maybe just roll those changes straight into BTF so I can easily pick them up. Um, <laughs> um, it, we can, we can, it has header fields with a, um, with, with, uh, with, with a all dictionaries, all containers are named. Um, most normally with a co with a compilation unit name, but possibly but possibly also with a module name for kernels, and there is a parent dictionary name. Um, for C CTF v4, also has a couple of fields giving the number of types in the, in the parent and the string table length in the parent, so you can detect if you've imported the wrong one, and fail, because obviously that leads to a wildly corrupted import if you've got the, if you imported the wrong parent. And now we can tell. Uh, we can represent static scope variables. BTF already has patches that have just been submitted, which, which means it can represent all of those as well. We have this symbol type table thing, so we can represent ELF uh, symbols efficiently, including if the types for them are conflicted and they're represented in there and they're stuck in child dictionaries, uh, without having to represent some massive some massive pile of nulls for empty symbol tables or, or something like that. We have a flat, our, our string table offsets are slightly different. The high, if you flip the high bit on, it means get this string from some other, some other place. That some other place is always the elf dynamic symbol ta string table, which means that if there's a string in the string table, you can pull it straight, you can pull it straight out, of the elf, uh, out of an elf binary without spending any, straight, any space on it. 
um, which saves space for symbols, mostly. Uh, and we can encode much larger types. Um, that's quite hard to change in BTF because you need to change the VLEN and so on. I have a representation for this in CTF, which doesn't in CTF v4, which takes no extra space for the common case. You might want to just steal it and stick it in, and, and stick it in, this, in uh, BTF. It's in the cauldron talk. Um, I even have some crazy, ridiculous future possibilities, which under no circumstances should we implement yet. Uh, in particular, BTF has an advantage over older C CTF versions because the type IDs and the string offsets run directly into each other from parents to children. You're not restricted to a two-level nesting. You could have a three-level nesting. You could have a 50-level nesting if you wanted to, but I've only got a use for a three-level nesting. Um, which is that you could have a th which is that you could have a split BTF nesting with the core kernel as the top level, modules for the level underneath it, and conflicting types inside each module named after the translation unit as the level underneath that. And now we've represented the entire type system with no loss of information. I don't know if this is any actual use because I've got no clients know how to deal with it and. Honestly, I don't know how you'd be able to distinguish, yeah? I would know. <laughs> oh. Uh, just the drag and debugger right now, uh, you can just CTF. Oh, cool. The drag and debugger, at least we're working on CTF support and BTF support, and it we would love to have a way to look up, uh, provide a CU name, and we have the APIs all there. Oh, right. So as a client, we would, right away want to use it and, and start using that API if well, it were there. Maybe so it's not that far out. Just, just a, yeah. a vote. For what it's worth, the libctf API basically already supports multi-level trees because, be, uh, because there's nothing in the API preventing parents from having parents of their own. Uh, the only thing which is preventing it is that the CTF3 file format didn't support it. But BTF does! It just, no clients know how to handle it. Uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what clients that can handle split BTF would think uh, existing clients if they were faced with multiple levels like this. Um, my, um, uh, my other question in this area is that we are, th um, one of the things in the Cauldron talk, the slides that I didn't include in here, is that we are trying to maintain compatibility with BTF even when we omit CTF before by exploiting something which seems to be a feature of the BTF file format but is nowhere documented, which is that there is a header length in the header this is really, this, I think this is really clever, I wish I'd thought of it. There's a header length in the header, which says how long the header is, which means that the header could be a different length from what clients are expecting. People could, you can stuff extra fields in there, which rep represent other sections which the BTF cli clients may not know how to read, like all the extra sections that CTF knows how to handle, like symbol type tables and that sort of thing. Um, the only thing BTF clients seem to refuse to do in this case, or at least the PA hole, the only thing it seems to refuse to do is, is read foreign Indian stuff and byte swap it. I would suggest that this is an unnecessary piece of paranoia and that it should even work in that case and byte swap all the things it knows about and just ignore all the rest. Because it's not like it could do anything with them anyway. They're sections it doesn't understand. Uh, and, it, and in that case, it would be able to read CTF v4 with no difficulty. And if it had Alan Maguire's layout section, it would be able to read the type section, traverse it, and just ignore the fact that this isn't actually BTF, it's a superset. Um, and it would treat all the, C, all the CTF in user space as if it was kernel BTF with no trouble at all. And suddenly we'd gain all the BTF tooling in user space with no difficulty. And it could, over time, learn how to deal with all the CTF additions and we could migrate them into BTF and improve them in whatever ways you liked. And you'd gain quite a, bit of, quite a bit of stuff straight off the bat, which would be quite nice. All you'd have to change is the um, assertion in dwarves and other readers that says, if the length is wrong, refuse to, and the endianness is wrong, refuse to do anything. Instead, just refuse to byte swap. Just refuse to byte swap the things you don't know about, which you don't know about them. You're never going to deal with them in any way. Why bother trying to byte swap them? <laughs> if you don't understand the section, why byte swap it? <laughs> um, I think that's, that's basically it. There's some links here to how CTF in general works. I had a link earlier to the Cauldron talk. There's a link on how the deduplicate, to how the deduplicator works, uh, which has links to the deduplicator source code itself, which starts with a gigantic comment explaining how it works. Um, one of the things the du deduplicator is doing, which is not exported to CTF, but which we could export to both CTF and, if wanted, BTF, is that it generates SHE-1 IDs for every type, uh, which, ex which encode the, if two, but which encode, the, basically, if the two, if the two SHE-1 IDs are identical, the type and all of its, all, all of its, the types it depends on are identical. 
and we could expose that somehow. I, exposing it in the file form by default seems like a bad idea because SHA-1 IDs are so incompressible. But we could maybe turn them into straight integers and stick them in there, stick them in there or something, or stick them in there only for types which are exported in some symbol table or expo exported as variables or something like that. So that consumers could easily say, hey, these two things are exactly the same. We don't need to do any more than the simple equality test to, test to check it. I think that would speed up Abigail for starters. It might speed up other things. I don't know if anything cares about this. It might help the verifier. Does the verifier care if two types are identical? Maybe not. <laughs> but anyway, you see, I'm kind of this is, the code for this is only half of this change is only half written, so I'm still amenable to substantial changes. Um, I, uh, precisely which bits are written is described in the Cauldron talk, but basically the parts I've handled are handling the parts I've already written are well, I'm now I've now got a version of CTF which uses the BTF way of splitting type IDs and strings between parents and children. Those were the hard parts. Check handling the new type kinds and so on, that's easy. <laughs> um, so I hope I, I, I hope I hope this is enough. I hope people have opinions. I hope they can at least tell me this isn't a completely insane idea and it's not and they're not going to completely ignore out of hand the possibility of using a different deduplicator. But Thank you. Any questions? Or pitchforks, or or pitchforks. If there are yeah, any pitchforks, yeah. please throw them. Uh, uh, please, no Molotov cocktails. I think the maintainers of the building might be less happy. Thanks, Nick. That was great. Um, if you're taking PA Hall out of the picture, there's probably a couple of things you need to do. Only half. It yeah. still reads stuff in. It just doesn't need to deduct. Yeah, yeah. So, in terms of what it does in particular, you'd need to think about the early and late dwarf stages. So when with late dwarf, we get information about, you know, cases like optimizations and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And Jung Hong and I are gonna be talking about that tomorrow in, in a talk about how we might look at extending BTF to handle some mm -hmm. of those cases. So we probably need to think about that. Yes, the, if there were, I, I only heard about this this morning, uh, the compiler would obviously need to emit some sort of extended BTF. And as long as there's a coherent way of debugging it and of, of, of deduplicating it and figuring out conflicting type info in that situation and so on, I would c completely agree that it should be folded into, into libcdf in the deduplicator and we should be using it. It seems like a nice piece of extra info to have. As long as we do, as long as we do a better job than GDB does of telling that things have been optimized out uh, when it frequently says they've been optimized out when they haven't been. <laughs> and I suppose the other thing would be BTF. We, we annotate um, k funks as well, so we need to make sure we, we, we cover that. Yeah, um, it's, but it's, it's just, a, it's just a, another, function uh, another function type, isn't it? It's, yes. I mean, the, uh, I mean, CTF v4 has a distinction between variables, which in v4 are going to be BTF kind var, just as in uh, just as in BTF, and symbols, which are specifically variables which are reported by the linker as being elf symbols, and they disappear from variables and turn into and move into these symbol type tables. Um, it seems to me that this would be handled perfectly well by that system. They just stay as variables yeah. of type function, and yeah. that it would just work. Which is nice, it means I don't need to do any work. <laughs> and I suppose one final thing, one other thing that you get from this approach is you promote types from modules to the kind of core, yeah. the shared BTF. And that saves a lot of space overall, obviously. Do you have a sense for how much that would grow the core kernel representation? It's, all I can say is for... For, uh, for, for the CTF archives, which are a little bit bigger because at the moment we're not deduplicating strings properly the way, the way BTF does, um, the core kernel representation, if you fuse them all together, is about, eight, is about four megabytes, and the shared repo is about five, and all the modules are all the rest. If you fuse the two together, it comes to about six or, it comes to about six or seven, so it's no more than a megabyte or so. There's a, there's a bit in there, but there's not much. Yeah. Um, which is why I was not not terribly not didn't think it's terribly significant. The, my only worry is what about types that two modules are using as a private interface, but which have the same name as something that bits of the core kernel are using as a private interface. And there are some of those, and we suddenly have conflicting types up the wazoo. Again, I don't think it's terribly significant, and the deduplicator would handle it automatically, even as it is now. I, the only reason I really split it into a separate module is because A, Solaris CTF did that, <laughs> and B, it just seems a tiny bit more elegant to me. It's not a module as such, but it's, it's not, if you see what I mean, it's not, the say, it's not exactly the same thing as the, a pile of shared stuff that all the modules can see. There can be things that are private to just MM, 
which you can't make into a module. And it seemed nice to me to hive them off into something separate so the modules couldn't see it even if they wanted to. Maybe I'm just, just over-designing as usual. Um, no one thinks this is insane and I shouldn't do it. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. I mean, it means less work for you, so I guess that's a good thing. Uh, I don't know if it appears. So, in case someone will have feedback for you, where yep. where that feedback could be directed? Billy tools list. Okay. Which is pretty free for all and pretty nice to people. Oh yes, I, I don't know if the PA Hill maintainer is here. Oh good. Right, so that, that that means I don't. If they haven't been complaints in that direction, I'm very happy. Not completely insane. Fantastic. <laughs> So, well, the, the room is not in flames. All right, thank, thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. That was fun, Brisbane. That was perfect. <laughs>